Years ago, a comic book artist would hope, some, some of them at any rate, to move on to become advertising artists. That paid more money. Or magazine illustrators. That paid more money. Today, there are almost no art fields at all that pay more or even as much as a good comic book artist can earn. Over the last 10 years, I think the lot of the artists is, is an awful lot better than it was. If you sell over 50,000 copies, you get a, a royalty and a percentage on, on every copy after that, which was completely new. That didn't happen before. I love the fact that today, artists and writers and editors, perhaps even some publishers, have attained superstar status amongst the fans. Yeah, we get a lot of very positive positive letters from America. It's, it's great. It's, uh, obviously, they're the people who read it, and, and they're your audience, and they're the ones you've got to thank for it all, really. I am so happy to see that this thing has grown and evolved, and now when I go to a comic book convention and I see people lined up, they're lined up around the block for their favorite artist's autographs. Gosh, I wish I'd brought my autograph book. So many people who have comic book conventions will take ads in newspapers and other magazines on the radio and television and announce that so-and-so is going to be there to make a speech or to sign autographs. That's what's so nice about going to a convention and doing a signing and being able to talk to the people who buy it. It's essentially they're getting their, all their fan letters uh, mentioned in person. Sorry, folks, uh, no time for autographs, uh, but you may applaud if you wish. <laughs> That's wonderful. It, it makes it, it makes comics become as viable a field as movies, television, or anything of that sort. De definitely, there's a, a buzz about it, and the artwork being collectible. It's not. It's nice to know that issue one of Death's Head is like worth uh, what the last last issue sold for thirty five dollars in San Diego. It's quite nice. I'm not going to complain about that. The artwork that we do gets returned to us, and then we can sell it through a dealer or by ourselves at a convention, or we can retain it if, we, if we'd like. Brian Bolland, an English illustrator who worked on Batman, uh, sold a page of The Killing Joke for, well, reportedly for 700 pound. Uh, that's on top of what he was paid for it originally. There are a number of female writers and artists, but they certainly are in the minority. It's always been a male-oriented sort of thing, I think, and from, from the early days of comics, it's been, the, the storyline's always been, like, very macho, and the, the heroes have been, like, Batman and all male characters, but, I mean, I, I think nowadays it's a lot, a lot more of the lead characters are women, and they're just as strong and sort of intelligent as, you know, the men. Now we meet Storm, whose mutant ability to control weather itself is still not completely understood. There's a sort of a mythology in the industry that women can't do the kind of things men can do. They can't draw punches, they can't draw sexy women, they can't draw perspective, they can't draw whatever, they can't draw large hands. Uh, it's, it's just that mythology. It, women can draw anything a man can draw. Forget it, lady! I'd like to think that as a woman I have a different perspective to offer to the comic book industry. I can understand why women wouldn't read comics or women, women wouldn't be interested in getting into the comic book industry. I know why I enjoy it. Um, it's just a wonderful creative process to get involved in. Well, this cover was one that I had to really beg my editor to do. My editor at the time was also a woman editor. And um, she really liked to see a lot more action on the covers because action attracts kids to the books. But I felt with this story, it wasn't that kind of a story. It was a story about two characters struggling um, to come to terms with a war and with some of the things that had happened to them. And I felt that it would appeal to some of the readers because it was minimal. And it, it was just maybe powerful in its, in its being quiet. And uh, a lot of the female readers responded very favorably to this cover. I do like to think that the women characters in my books are a little bit more assertive, a little bit more forceful, possibly a little bit more intelligent. If I, if I find a writer wanting to portray a woman in, in a way I think that's negative, I can at least say, please, you know, consider, reconsider, do it this way. Magneto, your deliverance is at hand! Well, my friends, they, I, I've talked to them about this and they say, oh, well, I don't like the way women are portrayed and they're all really very busty and 
curvaceous and lovely and stuff and it's like yeah well but so are the men so you know you can't really argue that okay this figure's um sort of inspired by one of the characters from the x-men called Deathbird, i think her name was um i really like the sort of the costume she was wearing it's it's very spiky and armored and she's a bit crazy this character so a lot of women think that um it is the same as it was years ago and we're moving our dancers in distress and only get get rescued by the, by the male characters so I mean, it's not so anymore <laughs> translate a comic book to a motion picture you're going to gain something that the motion picture has to offer that you can't put in a comic and you're going to lose something that a comic book can do that you just can't do in a motion picture in the case of our comics being produced as video games you gain a lot and you lose a lot gain a lot of exciting visuals of course you lose a lot of story you can't have the same kind of story in a video game that you have in a comic book uh, when you're reading a comic the, the story has already been set and it's, it's almost as if a reporter is telling the story of what happened it's almost a newsreel, whereas with a, with a, a computer game, you're setting that story, you're making history. Um, you know, you can play Spider-Man, you can make a move around, and no two games will ever be the same. You're trying to balance your freedom on the computer to make it do all sorts of fantastic things. You can't have you know, Spider-Man doing things he doesn't do in his comic. You know, you couldn't undress him. You know, it's pretty exciting what's going to happen in the future. And as regards to virtual reality, uh, interacting with you know, the character itself, you could wear a Spider-Man suit and you could move around and as you're moving. I um, you'd look extremely bizarre doing it if somebody was watching you. You'd have this mask on it and you would see uh, what Spider-Man was doing. You'd move around, it'd be amazing. Uh, and that technology isn't too far away, I'd say before the end of the decade anyway. The reason why there are a lot of British programmers and in fact a lot in the Northwest, and um, the reason why it's Maybe because it's, it's quite rainy in the northwest and people stay inside a lot more. I mean, and you have to do something, so you, you tend to find people will, will get a computer and, and learn to program. Whereas if you're in sunny California, the last thing you can do is sit inside and program a game. You're going to be you'll be better at surfing. I think people never outgrow their love of fairy tales or of that type of story. If you think about it. There is no place else where you can get what I would refer to as fairy tales for grown-ups other than in comics, in superhero comics, because it's the same thing. You have people with superpowers. You have stories that involve fantasy, the supernatural, and yet they're stories about real, living people, flesh and blood people who live in today's world for the most part, so I feel that today's comics, to sum it up, are like fairy tales for grown-ups.